evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone tonight? Good. Yeah, again, thank you for coming out to join us for this edition of the Von Karman Lecture Series. Over the past decade, NASA has launched a series of Earth remote sensing satellites with powerful new capabilities. They provide a richly detailed picture of atmospheric processes. While that picture is complex and difficult to interpret, it offers the potential of a long-term detailed record of the atmosphere as it undergoes climate change. Tonight's talk will describe some of the challenges in understanding satellite data sets, show recent results, and speculate on future insights. Tonight's speaker is an atmospheric scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, whose specialty is analyzing satellite observations of the Earth's atmosphere. His primary affiliation is with the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder, where he is deputy project scientist. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from UC Berkeley and a PhD in astrophysical, planetary, and atmospheric sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And his research interests include atmosphere-ocean interaction, upper tropospheric humidity and clouds, and thankfully for us, public outreach. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Dr. Eric Fetzer. Let have it, Eric. Thank you. And thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about something near and dear to my heart, and I hope near and dear to most of our lives, and that's how we at NASA do uh, study climate with our satellite data sets. Um, climate is on everybody's, the tip of everybody's tongues today, um, and we're all concerned about climate change and particularly human impacts on climate. Um, I have a sort of a atmospheric water cycle perspective on things, and I'm going to argue, try and argue that climate and the atmospheric water cycle are inseparable, at least the atmospheric part of climate. Um, and so water cycle drives a lot of my interests, and it also has some important societal concerns. Uh, we're all concerned about fluctuating water supplies. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's just <laughs> everybody's fantasy, I'm sure. Um, and then, of course, lifestyle disruption. There's lots of talk about how climate change is going to affect people's lives. So it does affect lives in specific ways. Um, and uh, fortunately, there are a lot more serious issues than, uh, than beer and recreation. Um, and to take things locally, this is uh, the question I've posed in the past. Uh, the most important component of our water infrastructure in California is it Shasta Dam, is it the California Aqueduct, is it hydro power that pumps the water? The simple fact is that it's snowpack. Um, we are critically dependent upon a stable snowpack in California for things like agriculture and certainly for water supplies in Southern California. So. Um, and I'll talk later about the projected uh, history or what will happen with snowpack in the coming decades. And I hope by the time I'm done talking, you'll understand why people like Arnold Schwarzenegger take these climate change issues extremely seriously. Because we've spent billions, if not trillions, of dollars on things like water infrastructure in the American West. And that, loss, that cost could all be thrown away if there's significant changes in how snowpack, for instance, changes. And of course, um, Access to clean water is critically important. Um, I'll just use one little example. This is a picture from actually a UN site. But um, we've heard a lot about Yemen lately um, as a source for Islamic terrorists. Uh, the Christmas bomber was trained in Yemen. Um, it looks like some people are saying it's the next, next Afghanistan. If you read carefully about Yemen, it also is in a water crisis. Um, for various reasons, there's a lot less water than uh, sh should serve the citizens of Yemen, and that's leading to in in political instability. So stable water supplies are critically important for things like national security. And indirectly, this is why, say, the Department of Defense is very interested in climate change issues, because that ha directly affects their job in the coming uh, generations. Um, so I'm a NASA scientist, so I'm going to have a largely NASA-centric view, but I'm going to try and reach out to uh, the broader world of climate science. And as we all know, NASA's good at building uh, and flying instruments. And I'll just give you an overview of some of the instruments we work with. And I'm a scientist, so I'm really most interested in this problem of doing science data analysis. Um, I am very fortunate to have colleagues who can build space instruments and launch them and get my data in hand. Um, and then I get to have fun with a lot of my coworkers trying to make sense of that data. Um, and Mark mentioned the AIRS instrument, and this is something near and dear to my heart. And NASA is 
a major, maybe the major producer of, certainly of innovative earth science observations. This is the AIRS instrument. When it's a baby picture from about 2001. Uh, I think it was actually, this was in, shot in Boston, if I remember right. Um, and you can see the things a couple, uh, roughly a yard or a meter on the side. Um, it was integrated into the Aqua spacecraft and launched in 2000, May of 2002. So one of these, I'm not sure which, I can't seem to find a web page that tells me, one of these two is AIRS, I believe it's that one. And so you can and I get a feel for how big these spacecraft are. That's roughly a yard, that's roughly a yard. So this thing's 30 or 40 feet long. It's roughly the size of a school bus. So uh, we as a nation have invested heavily in these sort of Earth science, or Earth observing satellites. Um, and we happen to be in what's called the A-Train, a satellite constellation. So AQUA is that instrument, and it flies in close formation uh, with a series of other spacecraft, excuse me, Aqua is that spacecraft, and Aqua flies in close formation with a, a number of other instruments or spacecraft. Um, airs is this one, I think. Um, you may have heard about the once in future OCO, the Orbital Car Carbon Observatory. Uh, the sad story is in January of 2009, it fell into the South Pacific Ocean during launch. Um, the good news is that NASA's decided it's so critically important to be able to monitor carbon dioxide from space that they're building a, essentially a replica of the new one. So JPL is back in the business of building OCO as it was for several years prior to last January. And we will have OCO in the A-Train constellation. So OCO, Aqua, CloudSat is a very interesting radar that uh, measures, the, measures cloud properties looking downward. And Calypso is a, a LIDAR, which is a, a laser radar measuring uh, cloud properties. And the nice thing is, and this is, I believe, MODIS over here and, and AMSER E, these are all instruments looking down and viewing our planet, providing people like me with data for analysis. The nice thing is these are all very close together. And if you lie on your back, as any child has done, and looked up at a cloud, you'll see that things change very rapidly. So, NASA had the foresight to launch all these things together so that when Aqua looks down and looks at something like temperature or water vapor, which I'll talk about quite a bit, um, CloudSat comes along shortly thereafter and sees what the cloud's doing right there. So we're not confounded by this problem of, well, what was happening half an hour ago. We literally look seconds later. So this is a, a very in powerful analysis tool for climate studies. And then Parasol is an instrument to launch by the French to, or a satellite launch to understand aerosols, so small particles that aren't clouds like dust and, and soot. And then Aura is another uh, spacecraft comparable in size to Aqua. And Aura has some instruments like MLS, which looks forward. And I believe this is TESS over here. And many of these instruments, by the way, are JPL run. It's a little appreciated, I think, that if you look at most, many of these instruments on, this pla on these platforms like OCO, AIRS, um, CloudSat, and MLS, and TASS, these are all actually run by JPL. So we have, a, we have a fundamental role in observing climate from space right here at JPL. So we're not just a planetary uh, house shop. We do lots of, and lots of uh, other sorts of atmospheric sciences. Um, and in addition to those ones in the A-Train, oh, well, this is, there's, some, there's some duplication here, but you can see we fly a whole bunch of, other, a whole bunch of satellites to observe uh, weather and climate and physical processes in the atmosphere and in the, in the oceans. Um, things like ISAT, which I believe has gone south, but GRACE is a very interesting instrument to measure the mass of the planet, so it can very subtly ma measure things like the amount of, uh, of ice on Greenland, say, uh, some very interesting work done with GRACE, TRIM and GPM. These are instruments that measure rainfall. Um, I've already talked about Aura. Air, Terra is an analogous platform, one of these bus-sized things. It's actually in another orbit. Calypso, uh, I just showed you. CloudSat, Aqua, I just showed you. And these are some other instruments that measure up into the stratosphere. So we have a whole bunch of instruments and long record of observations from those instruments actually going back into the 70s, in the 60s in some cases. So the challenge to us as scientists is to make sense of all this. Um, I'm going to repeat some themes today. Um, the basic one is that um, physical principles determine climate. Um, I'm, a, I'm a physicist by training. 
Uh, we live in a world where prediction matters, which prediction, as I'll talk about, means being able to solve basically equations of motion or equations of physical behavior. Um, so we have to understand in process and in detail these, the physics of, of how the atmosphere or how the climate system behaves. And this means it's a fundamentally science-driven endeavor. Um, we have to pose hypotheses that are testable. Uh, we have to make observations to test those hypotheses. So, but the basic fact is that physical principles uh, determine climate, and we as scientists are trying to understand those. Um, the water cycle and climate are really inseparable. Um, we tend to think of them somewhat different, but think about it, rain comes out of a cloud. Clouds are fundamental to climate. I hope one of the messages you'll get it by the end of the day today is that clouds are a big question in climate prediction in particular. Um, and clouds are obviously coupled to the water cycle. Um, and just in, in the interest of full disclosure, or nearly more complete disclosure, um, atmosphere is only one component of climate. Um, I see my colleague Ichiro Fukumoko, Fukum, Fukumori, Fukumori, I'm sorry, I do know how you pronounce your name. Um, and uh, he's an oceanographer, and he would say, well, climate isn't just about the atmosphere. And I don't want to I don't want to get you folks to leave thinking, oh, it's all just an atmospheric problem. Actually, oceans are fundamental to understanding climate as, is our, as our uh, ice sheets. So um, I have an atmospheric perspective because I'm an atmospheric scientist by training. But um, be aware that there's a whole other world out there of people doing things like ice sheet dynamics and oceanography. Um, so there are obviously strengths in challenges to this and the strengths are that we a satellite has nearly global coverage so if you want to understand the global climate system your best bet is to look at satellite data um, and um, these days the data rates from satellites are enormous we get terabytes of data per day um, I saw recently that the entire Library of Congress can be stored in about 14 terabytes I recently ran out and bought 40 terabytes I'm not going to pretend that I am more knowledgeable than all the books in the Library of Congress, but we have a lot of data coming in. Um, so those are the strengths. And the challenges are that satellite, first off, satellites have very specific global coverage and this, for certain questions you can't answer everything with a satellite. You can't put a geostationary satellite over the pole. It just, orbital physics presents that. We'd love it, but it's just not going to happen. So we have challenges with understanding things like the diurnal cycle with satellites, and most importantly, data are not information. Um, we have to interpret that data into something that we would call information, knowledge, and ultimately our job as scientists is to inform the public and inform policymakers about what this data tell us. So this is what science is about, going from data in a hard, well, actually numbers coming out of a spacecraft, to ultimately somebody make a decision, an informed decision based on analysis of data. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to prove that sentence wrong, basically turn information into data, or turn that sentence inside out. Um, so how are we affecting climate? It wouldn't be a climate talk if I didn't talk about how people uh, are affecting climate. Um, Though I like to point out that I didn't go to graduate, when I went to graduate school in the 1980s, uh, there was no talk about climate change. I was interested in just in I'm trying to understand this, the physics of what was going on in the real world. Um, but meanwhile, I've driven my car a lot and produced a lot, a lot of carbon dioxide. So um, we are produce, uh, affecting climate really in three main ways. The most notorious is through greenhouse gas emissions. Um, most famously, carbon dioxide. Um, and, but there are also other gases like methane, nitrous oxide, um, chlorofluorocarbons that, that, that cause ozone destruction. Um, those are all other greenhouse gases. And I happen to have been born in the International Geophysical Year of 1957. And in that year started a series of observations at Mauna Loa by, by uh, Charles Keeling, who died a couple of years ago. And this is carbon dioxide at Mauna Loa, the, the volcano in Hawaii. Um, and what one sees in the, inter in the 50 or so years since these observations began is that the, the amount of carbon dioxide has increased from about 315 parts per million. It turns out it's just about 390 right now. So this curve's a little bit old, but um, we've seen about a 30% increase in 
carbon, atmospheric carbon dioxide in my lifetime, and it's largely because we burn things, but not entirely. Um, if you trace this curve back, it would go down to about 310 parts per million in about 1800. And what happened in 1800 is we started doing things like cutting down trees in the American East and moving westward into the, into the prairie. Um, so land use practices have actually significantly contributed to greenhouse gas increase, as has, um, and we, at the same time, as anybody knows who's flown over the United States, you can look down and see that the surface is not the way it would have looked 300 years ago. We are, we're plowing it and we're moving water around, and those, those effects actually, those are land use practices actually do have an effect on climate locally. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing is, is basically agriculture and building houses. Um, we live in a heat island, a uh, little exercise. Find the record um, cold temperature for today, and um, if it was bef it was after 1930, I'll give you 10 bucks. Um, the, all our record lows are back in the 19th and early 20th century. So we live in a heat island. We're actually directly affecting our local climate by living in, well, building streets and living in dark roofed houses. Um, so land use practices do have a local effect that we all live with, um, and another factor that that humans have in climate is aerosols. Um, there's a lot of discussion about aerosols and how they affect climate, but aerosols can either absorb things like uh, soot, dirty, sooty aerosols from burning coal, say dirty coal burning, or in South Asia, people burn animal dung, dung and wood, and those, those aerosols actually absorb sunlight. Others reflect sunlight. Um, in fact, there's a geoengineering proposal some of you may have heard about where people want to inject sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere to make the stratosphere more reflective and counteract some of the effects of particularly carbon dioxide. Um, but aerosols, so in that case, we are affecting, would be affecting climate. But aerosols are certainly a player in climate. Um, and look out an airplane window next time you fly and you'll almost certainly see a dark gray band uh, that represents aerosols. So, <coughs> excuse me, I had a cold last week. Um, I like to show this slide, and it's the basic picture of energy balance, um, and it begins at home. We've all stood on a hot driveway or, or parking lot. In comes some sunlight. It's about 300 watts per square meter. Hits the driveway, and it gets re-radiated as infrared heat. We're all familiar with infrared heat, even though you may not have taken it in physics class. You walk by a warm, heat-warmed wall, or for that matter, a, a driveway, you'll sense heat. Your skin is actually very sensitive to heat radiation or infrared radiation. So this is a basic picture of, of, a, of a, a body under illumination by sunlight. And the critical thing here is that there's a long-term balance between that sunlight coming in and the heat re-emitted back into space. OK. So um, let's look now at the greenhouse effect. This is actually, it's actually quite a simple thing to understand. Um, we've got that same picture of a driveway. We have sunlight that comes in about, again, about 300 watts per square meter. Some of that, or that heat is re-radiated, or is radiated from the driveway or some other dark surface. Um, if we in interpose a greenhouse gas or certain types of clouds, and I'll show you some examples of what types of clouds those are. Um, some of that heat is actually re-emitted to the ground. So just as the ground emits heat, greenhouse gases re-emit heat. And some of it goes back into the ground. The net effect is that the surface warms a little bit. And this slide holds true whether we're on Earth or Mars or Venus. This is not a human effect. This is just the consequence of having an atmosphere that happens to be absorption, absorptive in the infrared. So. Um, what's interesting here is that there's still heat going out into space. This is, imagine things are not changing significantly. It's, as we say in physics, steady state. So there's still sunlight coming in. There's uh, infrared going out. There's still a long-term balance between incoming and outgoing radiation. So viewed from space, you'll still see sunlight going in, heat coming out. But critically, the surface is now warmed. And so this is what a greenhouse effect what the greenhouse effect does. It warms the surface of a planet. This is why the Earth, even if humans weren't here, would be a lot warmer than the surface of the moon. Um, and we just happen to be, at, by increasing that ever so slightly, and it is a small effect, 
we are increasing the greenhouse effect from natural gases. <coughs> to give you a feel for what, how climate works now, I'm going to start locally. And this is a snapshot, a picture I love. Um, there's JPL, so we're looking at Southern California Bight here, the coast and the land, obviously. Um, and this was from a, about four years ago. And what was unusual is we had our classic marine layer in May. So the May gray, if you happen to be on the beach in, in Long Beach, it was slightly gloomy. Meanwhile, we had thunderstorms over Southern California. And these, these uh, storms illustrate um, the basic effects of clouds and actually greenhouse gases um, on, on the planet. So these thick clouds um, actually reflect sunlight very efficiently. So our June gloom is actually a really efficient reflector and, and that's, that coast or offshore of Southern California and Baja California in the summer, there's actually a, a net cooling effect because so much sunlight is being reflected by all those low white clouds. So those thicker clouds actually cool the planet. Um, and of course, in between, there's greenhouse gases, and those warm the surface, okay? Just as I showed in that previous slide. Um, and then it turns out that these high, thin clouds, cirrus clouds, the kind you'll see out an airplane window, you'll often look out and see a very thin cloud layer at roughly the altitude of the airplane. Um, those actually act like a, generally act like a greenhouse gas. So some clouds cool the planet by reflecting sunlight, and some clouds warm the surface by absorbing that outgoing radiation and acting like a greenhouse gas. And the real challenge here is, as climate scientists, if we want to predict climate, and people are doing that happily, we need to be able to understand these processes in detail. And that's basically my job and several of my colleagues in this room. Our job is to try and make sense of these sorts of observations. So that's the local picture. And now I'm going to move on to the next step up from that simple picture of your driveway, now that you've seen how the real world looks. And this is an energy balance diagram drawn by Kevin Trenberth at National Center for Atmospheric Research. And you still have, in this case I'm being exact, we have 342 watts per square meter of sunlight coming in. And some of it gets reflected. And some of it gets absorbed, and there's all this stuff going on here, and some of that is outgoing. And so the thing you'll notice if you add those numbers up, that the same amount going out, or same amount, what's coming in is going out. Uh, we've got 342 watts coming in and 342 watts going out. But there's lots of other things going on here. Um, many clouds reflect or absorb heat. Um, and you can see there's a little cartoon picture of a cloud which comes in, sunlight reflects off it, just like those low clouds in that previous slide. Um, some, of the, some of this sunlight is actually absorbed by the atmosphere, and in some cases that's things like aerosols. I don't think they're on that plot, but aerosols need to be included here, certain types of aerosols. Of course, there's absorption by the surface. Well, there's some reflection by the surface. Anybody who's been outside on a very snowy, sunny day knows that a lot of light just scatters back into space. Um, and then there's all this interaction between that surface re-radiation, just like the heat radiation coming off your driveway, um, encountering greenhouse gases. There's that famous back radiation, the greenhouse effect. Some of that is reabsorbed by the surface. There's things like evapotranspiration, so the evaporation of water, but that process works backwards. It takes heat to evaporate water, but that heat is then released in the atmosphere when it recondenses as clouds or rain. And that's actually a major player in the energy budget of the tropics. Um, um, so the imp one thing to note here is that water vapor is the most important of the greenhouse gases here. It's not called out, it just says greenhouse gases. But the major picture is greenhouse, is water, the major player as far as greenhouse gases go is water vapor. And you'll notice this picture doesn't show horizontal motion. You can think of the world's climate as a system that takes heat from near the equator and moves it up to near the pole where it gets dumped out into space in a very crude, simple way. That's basically what the weather, or the atmosphere and the ocean are working to do is sort of make sure the pole tries to get warmer and the tropics get cooler. And in this picture, carbon, the effect of doubling carbon dioxide is about one watt per square meter. So as one colleague says, this is a 1% game. Um, we're trying to understand this picture to 1%. Um, and that is a significant challenge. 
uh, just this is to illustrate my claim that um, that the water cycle and climate are coupled. This is a classic picture of the water cycle. And you see things like evaporation or evapotranspiration. Uh, condensation, that's that re-emission, or that conden water condensing, water vapor, so stuff that evaporates off the surface of the, of the ocean would then recondense as clouds and rain. Uh, some of that gets pulled inward. There's all this radiative exchange between the surface of the planet and clouds and rain. Um, and then, of course, it falls as, as water, surface water over here. So this is all coupled. The energy budget and the water budget are tightly coupled, and climate is fundamentally part of this whole picture. So um, if you want to understand clouds, you, you have to understand the water cycle because clouds are part of it. It's very much the integrated picture. It's the Gordian knot. Unfortunately, we don't have a sword. We have to untie the knot, and that's what we work to do. Um, I do it most days. Um, so just to illustrate to you folks how, how the real world works, I've shown you a local picture. I've shown you a cartoon of, the, of your driveway, which is very simple. I've shown you a local picture of a snapshot of Southern California in May of 2006 that showed those low clouds reflecting and high clouds uh, partially absorbing, et cetera. And I've shown you an energy budget. And this is the real world now. This is global temperatures from the AIRS instrument. Um, and it's a one day, a one year loop, um, and this surface, this altitude is about five kilometers. And I just want to point out this is not quali quantitative. There's not a color bar that tells you exactly what the colors are, but red is warm, obviously, and purple or black is uh, cold. And so, remember, temperature is the fundamental physical property of a of a body. Um, if we want to understand things like how clouds interact with water vapor, we need to understand the temperature, or how radiation behaves, we need to understand temperature. So this is the basic thing we're looking at. And as I roll the movie, you can see it's not a snapshot. These are roughly one day, I believe, per, per uh, slide. And the first thing, you obvious, it was obvious to me at least, is that you have this wavering line between a warm tropics and a cold pole. And those are what we call storm systems. Um, these systems, as I said earlier, act to move heat from down here up to there. Because it's much colder here, and it's just basic, the basic way fluids work where they want to flow from warm to cold. Um, I'll run it again. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Um, there's some other things going on. Um, I think most noteworthy, uh, it's always worth pointing out that the tropics are warm and more or less constant temperature. They're warm, obviously, because they get more sunlight. They're constant temperature because we live on a rotating planet. If this were Venus, where things don't rotate, that temperature would, might look quite different. But because we live on a rotating planet, it's very difficult for a spot like that to be warm and something else a few miles or hundreds of miles away to be cold. The atmosphere wants to adjust itself to the constant temperature on the equator. Um, and so we go to warm tropical places because we live on a, on a rotating planet. Um, it makes for a very equitable climate in the tropics. And of course, the other thing you might have noticed is that this whole thing sloshes north and south following the sun um, as it, the sun warms the surface of the planet. So this is our basic set of observations, temperature. And this is about three miles above the surface. Now let's look at water vapor. Remember I said water vapor was a greenhouse, was the most important greenhouse gas. So this is water vapor at about three to 10 miles. And this is roughly where water vapor is the most, green, most effective as a greenhouse gas. Um, if I were to show a map of carbon dioxide, it would be much smoother than this. But water vapor is, as you will see, a much more variable quantity than temperature. Temperature was kind of smoothly varying, especially in the tropics. There's nothing that says the tropics have to have constant water vapor. Um, oh, well, there's nothing that constrains water vapor to be constant on the equator. Um, what you're seeing here is these are regions of deep convection thunderstorms, basically. So in places like, like well, that's the Asian monsoon there. Um, when the Asian monsoon is in full bore, it, is, it acts to hydrate the upper troposphere, 
this altitude. Um, in other words, water vapor is carried from near the surface of the planet in these regions where there's lots of water vapor um, by thunderstorms. And a lot of it gets pulled out. The other thing to notice in the tropics is that you have lots and lots in some places and very little at other, in others. On the color bar or the color scheme used here, it's difficult to tell whether a minimum value over here is less or more than a minimum value over the poles. Remember, the poles were much cooler, obviously, than the tropics. But water vapor can go all over the place. And if we want to understand the, the greenhouse effect from water vapor in detail, we need these sort of observations. And this is why we as a nation invested in the sort of technology that I showed you in those first few slides. We need to answer qu fundamental questions about how the greenhouse effects works naturally, independent of us human beings. So the next step in complexity, so temperature was relatively simple. Water vapor is obviously significantly more complex. By the way, one thing I didn't notice, notice that you get these streamers of water vapor, and those are pulled out by those same storm systems that show up in the temperature. Um, so water vapor, temperature simple, water vapor is more complicated, and then clouds, really, things get real wild. This is a geostationary image. So this is taken from a satellite that might be sitting next to your satellite, TV satellite, somewhere off above the equator. Um, and this is looking down, actually, obviously, it's the United States satellite. It's looking down mostly at the US. And what you see here is a much more complicated picture than, certainly than temperature and, and more so than water vapor. So the clouds are themselves very rapidly changing. And this is an infrared image. This is a camera that sees in heat radiation rather than the visible radiation. And one thing you'll notice is the plant, the pulsation of the, of the continents. And that's because the sun comes up, warms, say, South America. Um, and that warming is shown here in black, essentially. And then you get a whole bunch of clouds that follow that warming. As anybody who's been in a warm tropical climate in the summertime, um, you'll get thunderstorms in the afternoon. You can go to the Midwest and see that. In fact, that's what you'll see over in here. So you have all those thunderstorm activities. In here, it's hard to see in the infrared, but those are all those low reflective clouds, our June gloom, but they get them off South America also. And this is a region where sunlight is significantly reflected back into space. Here are your storm systems where before, in temperature it was a nice clean wave and water vapor was stuff being, streamers being pulled out. In clouds, it's very detailed picture of, of behavior. And again, if we want to understand the greenhouse effect, we need to understand the effect of clouds on reflected sunlight and on that heat radiation that we're seeing with our, in this image. And last but not least, that is Hurricane Katrina. This was August of 2005, and this loop was put together to illustrate Katrina. And there it goes up into the Gulf and right over New Orleans. So there's a lots, of not, lots of very interesting phenomena buried in these sort of images. And so this is, these are clouds in the infrared. Um, and last but not least, let's look at clouds in the visible and the First thing you see is the so-called diurnal cycle, things getting dark and light over the course of the day. Um, but also look carefully, you'll see that some clouds are very reflective. There's a, the surface of the plant, there's a, actually a, a so-called sun glint spot right there. That's a place where lots of sunlight is being reflected off the surface of the ocean back into space, back into that earlier picture of the energy balance. This is a place where sunlight's being reflected. And some of these clouds, the very bright ones, are highly reflective, and others are less so. Um, you'll see a lot of the clouds that showed up in the infrared, say over the continents, are not nearly as apparent in the visible. And that is a manifestation of these clouds acting, those high thin clouds acting like greenhouse gases. So we're trying to understand these, this picture also in order to do climate physics and climate predictions better. Okay, so <laughs> now move on to climate and climate change issues, and one of the big concerns right now is whether the atmosphere or the climate system, it's not only the atmosphere because other components can behave similarly, whether there'll be a feedback. And feedback signals, feedback process is basically strength in the signal, and this is the classic, this is an image from my youth. My father would say, turn that down. Um, but if any, oh, I could probably do that by getting too close to the microphone. In this case, 
Jimi Hendrix's guitar would drive the, the amplifier. The amplifier would then feed back and drive the guitar strings. And we've all heard it. If I get too close to this microphone, it'll screech at us. This is the feedback process. It's a signal which is self-amplified. So the question is, are there climate signals that are self-amplifying? And the answer is yes, no, and maybe. Uh, some of them are well recognized, but a lot of our research is about trying to better constrain feedback mechanisms. Okay, so, oh, of course the result is this really loud feedback. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk today about two climate feedback mechanisms. I think if you got 20 climate scientists together in a room, there'd be about 50 possible feedback mechanisms. But I'm going to talk today about the two that are probably the most important and the most prevalent. Uh, the first is water vapor feedback. And this is quite important in the tropics. And the other is cloud feedbacks. And as I'll try and argue, these are the largest source of uncertainty in climate predictions and have been actually for about 30 years. Um, so I'll talk about two types of feedbacks, water vapor clouds. Um, so in the tropics, water vapor feedbacks, it's actually quite easy to understand. Warm air holds more water. Uh, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. So if you warm things up a little bit, so start with carbon dioxide, you tweak the surface temperature up a little bit, that means higher temperatures, you get more water vapor in the atmosphere. And because water vapor is a greenhouse gas, you get higher temperatures. And some people have speculated on a runway greenhouse effect. Uh, fortunately, that's not too credible anymore. It looks like uh, the, the greenhouse effect is, is going to clamp at some finite value, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, but what happens is sooner or later, you reach some equilibrium. You get the picture that there is this positive feedback between warming and water vapor. Um, and just to summarize it without going into excruciating detail about the feedback mechanisms, because I will go into excruciating detail about the feedbacks from clouds. Um, this is some work done by our colleague Andrew Dessler at Texas A&M. Uh, using the air's water vapor, and I'm going to read it to you because it's a pretty strong statement. Andy is not one to mince words. He says, the existence of a strong and positive water vapor feedback mean that projected business as usual greenhouse emissions over the next century are virtually guaranteed to produce warming of several degrees centigrade or Celsius. Uh, the only way that will not happen is if a strong, negative, and currently unknown feedback is discovered somewhere in our climate system. And frankly, right now, that pretty much says the holy grail of climate research is trying to come up with a strong, negative feedback mechanism to counteract the effect of water vapor feedbacks. And a lot of work's going into it, but unfortunately, it's currently unknown. We don't have, no one's come up with a plausible mechanism to cause a a strong negative feedback that mount, might counteract water vapor uh, feedback. And for that matter, the, the basic warming from carbon dioxide. Um, so I'll now talk about cloud feedbacks. And um, just remember that clouds generally to, do two, tort, two sorts of things. They reflect sunlight back into space or they act as, uh, as a greenhouse substance, not as a greenhouse gas necessarily, but as a substance, so they contribute to net warming. Um, so with this in mind, um, I'll pose some really big questions. How will each, how, or this is the, the critical question, how important will each of these effects become as CO2 increases? And I'll tell you quite frankly, we don't know. We simply don't know whether these cloud effects were going to become strong and positive, mildly weak, strongly negative. Though the, the money right now says they're going to be weakly positive. So there's going to be a slight positive effect from clouds feeding back on carbon dioxide. But it's, I'm not a gambling man. I wouldn't put a lot of money on that. I guess I'm, I, that was a <laughs> contradictory statement. But um, if I were a gambling man, I wouldn't put a lot of money on it. <laughs> Um, okay, so, <laughs> so the, there's a big challenge in all this, and that's modeling climate processes. Um, this is a fashion model, not a climate model. Um, so what's a climate model? And it's really a mathematical representation of the climate system. So I've shown you pictures of the climate system we see from space by satellite. We need to be able to 
embody those physics in a mathematical or numerical simulation of the atmosphere and the entire climate system. So it includes, a climate model includes a complex atmosphere. And think of the processes I've just shown you in the previous slides. We need to be able to have some numerical solution that plausibly replicates that behavior. But also other things, like an ocean that transports heat absorbed into tropics to high latitudes, um, potentially to do things like el melt ice sheets. Um, dust is a player in this. Dust or other aerosols. Um, obviously, greenhouse gases need to be included in here in addition to water vapor. Um, other pollutants, like, well, I've, I've thrown dust, soot in with dust, but keep dust and soot separately. And back to anthropogenic effects, um, China has become a major producer of dust because of uh, agricultural needs there. So dust has increased significantly in the past uh, 30 to 50 years, um, and similar effects are happening in the West. We had a visitor who, uh, who was actually here for a job interview, but he pointed out that the U.S. is actually considering regulating dust because of its effect on snowpack. If you get a lot of dust on snow, it actually absorbs sunlight much more efficiently and it can melt more easily. So there's been talk of regulating things like SUVs and making sure that, that tillage practices are, um, not SUVs, but off-road vehicles, make sure that tillage practices are improved so we don't get even more dust in here in the West. And the reason we build climate models, of course, is to forecast future climate. Um, there's been a lot of talk, certainly since the IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out in 2007, about climate forecasting and climate models are how we do climate forecasting. So I'll give you a feel for the state of understanding of cloud feedbacks in climate models. Um, this is actually from a science paper by Graham Stevens, and the, the figure is pretty simple. You just take 17 or so models, or 14, I've lost count, and you line them up. Um, you buy the sensitivity to double carbon dioxide. So one model says if you double carbon dioxide, there'll be about a two, a little less than two degrees Kelvin, or roughly four degrees Fahrenheit increase in uh, uh, warming. And another model says it'll be closer to 5 Kelvin, or roughly 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so let's look at the model that produced. So these are simply the model ranking and the, as, as they respond to, sense, to double carbon dioxide. So let's look at the model that this model in blue, shown in blue here, that has relatively strong warming. And this is the GFDL model, uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton. Um, and these, the plot you'll see is mostly blue. And the GFDL model predicts fewer clouds reflecting sunlight. So relatively speaking, the GFDL model sees fewer of those low, highly reflective clouds. So that GFDL predicts that we're going to have relatively fewer of those June gloom type clouds to reflect sunlight back into space. Because of that, it says there's going to be about a four degree Kelvin warming. So the main cause of that relative warming is because this model predicts relatively few clouds. And you can probably guess what I'm going to show you in the next picture. Let's look at a model with a relatively small amount of warming. And in this case, the figure is mostly reds and yellows. And, in, and lo and behold, and by the way, this is the NCAR model, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Um, in this case, the, the NCAR model predicts more low clouds. So it wants to make the planet a little more reflective, send more sunlight back into space. Consequently, it, it predicts a relatively weak warming. OK, so in a nutshell, this is the problem with cloud feedbacks. We don't know whether we're going to go that direction or that direction. Or for that matter, off the chart down here, though that seems highly unlikely. And some uh, gloom and doom folks think it may actually be up in here. But obviously, the good money, being, uh, being simple-minded sometimes, we vote that way. But right now, view this as a source of uncertainty. And by the way, this uncertainty was there 30 years ago. We didn't, 30 years ago, there was a famous report by Jewel Charney at MIT, and they came up with essentially the same range of numbers, roughly 2 to 5 Kelvin warming from double CO2. 
And it's all boil, it all boils down to our ability to properly or correctly model low reflective clouds. So <coughs> the conclusion, to repeat it, is, well, the first conclusion is that models with these more highly reflective clouds have less warming. Um, and for instance, the, um, the NCAR model, and obviously the GFDL model has, has um, fewer clouds and warms more. But I didn't talk at all about these high thin clouds. And those, depending on where, how those clouds end up, there could be more or less warming from a greenhouse effect like thing from those thin clouds. Part of the reason is these climate models do a very difficult, have a lot of difficulty in properly simulating high thin clouds. Um, there's a lot of work going into doing the climate physics, the cloud physics right in climate models. Um, so clouds remain the great conundrum and the great challenge of climate modeling, and they probably will through my career. Um, so what about the future? Um, there's pretty much unanimity on warming. This is from the 17 Intergovernmental Panel for, Panel for Climate Change Models. Um, that were, will run in basically southern and central California. All the colors represent, I think, those 17 models. And you can see a net warming up to this, this, these model runs were done in the early part of this decade. So up until then, there was a slight warming and then things take off with increased carbon dioxide. Uh, but the, you can see there's quite a bit of scatter. In this case, the increase is gonna be somewhere between one and three degrees C in our region, that's a prediction. Okay, and you'll see similar agreement for other places on the planet. There's, there's a unanimity that there will be warming because of carbon dioxide. There's not unanimity as to the amount. And I hope you'll understand why there's not unanimity as to the amount of warming. It has to do with those low clouds I just talked about, by and large. Um, so if we expect warming, why do we need to keep studying climate? And this gets back to this question about uh, water cycle. Um, now let's look at um, some of the warming related consequences. There's agreement as to predicted changes to California snowpack. The black line is the, either the observed up to 2000 or the average of those 17 models. And then the, the, um, the colors are the different model projections or predict are basically simulations of the of this basically the southern sierra snowpack um, actually I, yeah that would be mostly the southern sierra at those latitudes um, and what you see here is unanimity that there's going to be decline in snowpack in the southern sierra and again arnold schwarzenegger took a look at plots like this and started to become very concerned about climate change issues for california um, because this is essentially the water supply for us and also for agriculture in the southern San Joaquin Valley, which is a major driver of California's economy. Um, so there is some unanimity, but now let's look at something where, where there isn't agreement as to what the, uh, how the models will behave. And this is a prediction, or excuse me, a projection, as we like to say, of, um, of precipitation changes now in the same region in Southern California or the model simulation of, of the past history uh, between 1950 and 2100. And what you see here, whereas here we saw pretty much unanimity starting today, we're gonna drop by, the snowpacks are gonna decline by, nearly, will decline nearly to zero by 2100. And as for the amount of rain or snow that falls in the Sierra uh, between t roughly today and 2100, these projections are all over the map. Some think there's going to be significant increase in the amount of rainfall, in this case millimeters per day. Others predict there will be significant decline. Um, and this is coupled to the problem of reflective clouds. Remember, rain comes from somewhere and it comes from clouds. The models are not properly doing the cloud physics right, and they're probably, they, they're, or they're, they're not agreeing in what the cloud physics will be like, and as a consequence, they're not agreeing in what the snow and or rainfall will be like in our neck of the woods. And so one of the major challenges these days is to try and improve regional forecasts um, for climate models. Um, 
And that is a very tall challenge. So to summarize, I guess we're a few minutes early, but we can answer questions. Um, obviously, that's a truism. Satellite observations help us understand Earth's climate. Um, remember that many important climate processes are part of the water cycle. Clouds, precipitation are fundamental to climate, and they're fundamental to the water cycle. Um, some, under, some phenomena we understand quite well. We understand that if we continue to add uh, greenhouse gases, there will be some warming to the surface. Um, there's a lot of disagreement as to the degree of warming, but there will clearly be warming. There's no credible scientific theory right now that says there won't be warming because of carbon dioxide. Um, and that, that, wa that warming will be amplified by water vapor feedbacks. Um, this is the best scientific view right now. But a lot of things we don't understand, um, as I said before, aspects of the water cycle. We don't really understand the, the uh, future rainfall in Southern California. It could go either way. Certainly, we don't understand aspects of the water cycle regionally over land. Um, we don't fully understand how clouds act to heat and cool the planet, and most of, well, and how, how aerosols interact with that. I haven't talked about aerosols. There's a miser instrument here at JPL, and there's some very knowledgeable people about how aerosols interact with clouds. I haven't even touched on that. I'm trying to think, keep our focus on the natural, unpolluted atmosphere, just to simplify things. But this is a very important issue right here. And one of the things we still don't understand is how long-term changes in clouds will uh, heat or cool the planet in the future. Um, and as a scientist, the real challenge is approving climate forecasts. I mean, this is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, it's one thing to describe our data sets, but ultimately we have to improve forecasts because forecasts are, as they say in the, in the business world or a policy world, it's actionable knowledge. Um, what I've shown you so far is not useful, well, is, is not directly useful for improving climate forecasts. We need to get the better forecast to make more informed decisions about what to do if climate, if and when climate does change. With that, I'll take some questions. Can you, yeah, yeah, just make sure you come to the mic so everybody can hear. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you. My, my question is, when you're doing these measurements from space, how many uh, ground-based measurements do you do to verify that they're in agreement with one another, and what kind of percentage difference um, do you have? We do, those? one of the hats I wear is the AIRS validation scientist, so I spent about the first three years of my, well, after launch in 2002, um, looking at radiosondes, which are weather balloons, and our retrievals of things like temperature. So we looked very carefully at what a balloon said the temperature should be, and what air said the temperature should be, and what the balloon said the water vapor should be, and what air said the water vapor should be. Um, my colleague over here, Brian Kahn, has done similar things with cloud properties. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to make do ground truth validation. Yeah, you're welcome. What altitude are the A-train satellites at? Pardon? What altitude do the A train satellites uh, have? 700 kilometers, so somebody can probably correct me there. That's right. Uh, boy, this, I really have a, a lot of questions. I'll try to make it real brief here. Um, <laughs> we can always turn the mic off, don't we? Okay. <laughs> but the, uh, you, you, one of your earliest charts showed uh, the equilibrium of the whole atmosphere, and I. I, I understood that the reason the Earth is warming is because we're not in equilibrium. Uh, that is actually correct. We're out of equilibrium by about one, one watt per square meter. Where did my plot, plot go? Okay. Yeah. And So this one. That number should be, I say, 342. The best number is that it's about 341 out yeah. right now, roughly. And it, and it could take decades. If, if, if the CO2 uh, didn't keep increasing, it would still take decades for, for equilibrium to occur. Sure, it will, take, occur. It, it, will take, it will take 600 years for CO2 to get back to normal levels or pre-industrial pre levels if, if for some, have, some reason uh, everybody died off and but, but went back to But even if the natural. CO2 level, before you take that into account, yeah. just to, for the yes. ocean to warm and everything. Yes, for, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So... And then I'll just cut off this other important question was, uh, 
well, what are the pro if, if, if we haven't really made a lot of progress in understanding clouds in the last 30 years, mm -hmm. what is the real prospects for improving in the next 30 years? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a good, you should review our, our new proposal, yes. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. I mean, there, there, there are problems we may never be able to solve, quite frankly. Um, you know, this is a very complicated system. What we need to do is get these uncertainties down to something other than a factor of several. Where'd my plot go? These numbers, we need to reduce those numbers. The, the real, you know, think of this economically, the cost of a half a degree improvement in that uncertainty could be enormous. And so the challenge is to bring those numbers down. We may never get unanimity on what they are, what the, the true answer is. Aren't, aren't those IPCC numbers like based on triggers? What like, do you mean by triggers? You know, like, like the, the mythical ice melting into the uh, conveyor belt? And, uh, you know, no, you know no, how they oh, kind of no, stacked no. up this, all these? This is, well, I think what you're getting at is that, that often climate will shift sort of dramatically and go from one mode to another. Like when we came out of the ice ages or go back into the ice ages, there's these really strong shifts in climate. These are actually relatively slow incremental changes. Um, so none of the IPCC models featured these triggers because I thought they, that's one of the controversies. That's one of the was. controversies concerning particularly ice sheets. Okay. Some, some people think uh, that the ice sheets may actually catastrophically fail mm -hmm. and that we could get increase in sea level of something less than a foot to two feet that's been predicted and it could be two meters. So. What, what do you think about the idea that's being tossed around that all climate models ought to be made um, like an open source? Oh, so I, they frankly, be I, I by you, everyone in the community. That's I think that's a good it. idea. I mean, this is first off. It's paid. We're paid. For, we're supported by public funds. Um, those models should be made available to people. It's part of the scrutiny process. Um, so, um, I, 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 you, you don't I, want I, to look at really my source code, too. though. That's like, okay. The the, the cloud <coughs> video that you showed and all those different types of atmospheric videos, I find it baffling to think that someone thinks a, a formula can accurately um, pre pre predict such a movement in there, the atmosphere. An, it's th it, there's an excellent atmospheric department at UCLA, and you can go down and spend four years there and learn why, how, how we come up with these answers. But, but it, there's isn't not it triggered a formula. by like solar weather? Pardon? Are, well, aren't, aren't clouds triggered by, by uh, solar weather? To a certain degree. There's, Solar's thought to be about 10, you know, numbers like 10% of this warming could be solar change. All right, but what if, because the clouds are affected by solar weather there, and they're and created this, by solar weather, then, and especially with the variation in yeah, but the, see, in the there, amplification of the global warming. Then. Yeah, but this is not science, this is speculation. You need, you, if, you have a, if you have a testable hypothesis that we can use to, 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 quit, you know, to look into this, that's a great thing, but... You know, there, you can always, there's always, well, what about this and what about that? Give me a s hypothesis, ask me how I'm going to answer it, and make sure that it's credible within the context of our current understanding. I mean, this is, I'm a scientist, I'm not a soothsayer. So, um, this, I mean, this, this is really, the, the challenge here is to make it honest, mm. complete, thorough, open, and credible. So, yeah. So do, do the models also judge solar, take solar weather into account? Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Eric, I, one, thing you, one point I want to make is Eric this evening has been talking about degrees C, degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. or degrees Kelvin. That's what we scientists use. We're used to having our weather in degrees Fahrenheit, and what's important for people to realize is a Fahrenheit, if you convert centigrade into Fahrenheit, the Fahrenheit number is 2.2 times that number. Yeah. So when he says five degrees, we're talking way over 10 yeah, degrees. Yeah, roughly a factor of two. So if you, you can roughly double these numbers because these numbers are not precise. I don't think anybody would argue that, that that's exactly 1.8. Uh, but, but my point C. is, these numbers are twice as big as what you're probably thinking yeah. they are. Yeah. So, any other questions?
I was just curious. Uh, you've had these satellites up for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever study the uh, weather impact of uh, solar or lunar eclipses? Um, I, there was a, there was a, some people have looked into that, but I, I'm not sure of the details of it. Okay. Um, you do have a local cooling. You can go out in a, solar, in a complete solar eclipse and it gets a little bit cooler. I was wondering what it would do to cloud formation and things like that. I, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't, I don't either. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, He's back. Yeah, there was uh, a simple, I've seen a simple argument that you can uh, argue that storms will become more intense simply because as you warm the atmosphere, its capacity for holding water vapor increases mm -hmm. rapidly, exponentially. And so then it, with the same evaporation rate from the ocean, you'll, you'll have more uh, variation. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe that argument, or is it more, a lot more complicated than that? Um, I, I believe it, but in a hand-wavy sort of way. Um, I mean, you've, you've seen the, what the models are predicting for detailed moist processes, uh, there's credible arguments that extremes will become more extreme, basically. Um, and those are the arguments. But fundamentally, the atmosphere is believed to increase, the water vapors will increase as warming uh, occurs. Yeah, at two to three percent per Kelvin. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, different uh, satellites have different uh, measurements and different mm -hmm. levels. For example, the cloud sat that yeah. measures the reflection of the sun the, of, yes. the, of the clouds. Well, yeah, well, cloud sat measures is a radar instrument that measures the amount of, basically the amount of, of liquid water, so small water droplets in a cloud. I, I have some, this is our cloud sat image. So what's your question? I'm sorry. Well, the question is that uh, when it was <coughs> launched, they, was, they were saying that uh, over the last 50 years, they have noticed the uh, decrease in the amount of solar radiation arriving at this, uh, the Earth's yeah. surface. Yes. Um, and and uh, by considerable amount. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 most, the, the, the evidence for there's been a, a so-called solar dimming, and the evidence for this is so, from so-called pan evaporation. You take water, you put it in the middle of a field somewhere, and you come back the next day and you see how much has evaporated. Pan evaporation rates have actually been declining over the last 30 years, and it's thought to be because of, be because of aerosol pollution, that some sunlight is being reflected back into space, and that that is actually reducing the pan evaporation rates. Yeah. Could it be because of the jet engines flying and... Oh, yeah, this is one of many sources of, I mean, of I'm, reflective I'm, pollution. This was one of the uh, sources they talk about. Yeah, I in mean, fact, there's a, there's a rather interesting study done just after 9-11. People got out and looked at average temperatures um, because of reduced aircraft activity, um, and the nights got colder and the days got warmer. So it was direct... That was a very interesting, unfortunate experiment. Also, so, they, they said that... It's more actually in the northern hemisphere than the southern yes. hemisphere. Yeah, yeah, and because that, that's what most of the to... pollution sources are in the northern hemisphere. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. So I, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you could write a program that could um, accurately predict what, what the future weather is, you'd probably be a, a, a billionaire just from well, the no, advantages in, in, the, in the roofing industry alone, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, I, I wish I could. <laughs> you right? <laughs> and I do too. Um, yeah. Solar pro 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 processes are a dynamic process, and I just don't see how a random number, number generator in, in, in a computer could be accurate. I mean, we, we see in these charts when they're back tested on the on the back data, they're all over the place, and then suddenly in the future they like narrow. Have you published these results? No, no. I'm. What, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, this this is how we work. We we do our science and we submit a manuscript to a credible right. I mean, journal, I'm, and I'm then it's and it's reviewed. Here. So I mean, you know, that's 
unfortunately, there's a, there's a, it's, it, it is unfortunate. Science is not a democracy. It's a rather brutal uh, free-for-all. And sometimes, I, I, <laughs> it isn't I, I, always I mean, pretty, can, but. Like, but I mean, can you, can you uh, speculate on, on what, what, what I'm talking about here with the solar weather thing? I, I mean, the, the solar weather thing is, is it not It goes in a, cycles, but it's been, you know. It, it's, but it's not a credible scientific explanation for changes in clouds. But for clouds. I'll though. let my colleague Brian Kahn handle this. There, there was actually a recent paper by Gavin Schmidt. He thought that he showed that probably about less than 10% of the variability in the climate in the last 100 years was due to solar variability. But, but what about the, the effect on the clouds? And you guys still don't understand if they reflect more but yeah, I, I, so, so you're, you're, are you talking about <coughs> the amount of sunlight? No, what I'm talking about is, is um, that the solar weather affects the cloud patterns. So I, I'm, I, I'm not talking about the actual radiant heat from the sun. Yeah, okay. I'm talking about the electromagnetic energy. So like charged particles. And yeah, the, 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 the solar weather affects clouds. And admittedly, these models don't understand what um, the the um, net effect of the clouds are? Yeah. So the, it's it's not my field. Sorry to interrupt, Derek. No, go ahead. It's, I've it's been it's talking not my plenty. Field, but I'm aware of kind of two lines of research. One that has to do with cosmic rays. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, that is tenuous at bet, best evidence from the papers that have been published on this subject. That maybe there's a slight connection at best. But they're, they're, they're still working on that. And the other one is creating uh, 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 charged particles in the upper atmosphere, which somehow seed clouds. Right. And that's another tenuous connection. It, it has to come from uh, the sun. I mean, clouds just can't. <coughs> yeah, but, but so. it's, not, it's not a major driver <coughs> to uh, climate change <coughs> variabilities. Uh, if, if you come up with a plausible physical mechanism that's testable, I think you're onto something. But it's it's this is in the realm of religion. Um, it's faith-based science. We need to be able to test it. And if we can't test I'm it, it's not science. I'm just throwing some like ideas out. I mean, I, I'm sure you, you've like probably a, a, already thought of, of a, a lot of these things. But the, the, the problem is that I'm trying to understand it. The, these ideas have been worked on by by people, and they haven't really come up with anything that would support climate change based on those things. So it's it's so so as an alternative explanation for for global warming as you know solar effects, right? Uh, it, it's it's basically uh, been proven that, that that it's not the case. But has the effect on on the clouds been factored in, in, in into the models? Yes, yes. To, to, to yeah. In addition well, to the heat. No, they actually. haven't because there's no plausible mechanism that says connects, say, connects cosmic rays to clouds. If it were plausible and people could demonstrate that that mechanism mattered, Isn't there it would be. paper in the 70s about that? Well, there have been many papers, but they're, they're, unfortunately, they're speculative rather than, than physically based. And as you know, these, as you've seen, I hope you've seen, it's very difficult to do cloud physics right. And this is somewhere that's way, way, way out on the fringe of the basic mechanism cloud meca uh, cloud formation. We it, explore every we, yeah, and it, but the, the, this, the, there just isn't enough evidence that supports this as a possible mechanism for climate change. You're, you're like talking about the uh, interaction of the cosmic rays. Yeah, and cosmic solar rays, rays or the formation of ions. Yeah. From why, why don't we take us off? As we say, take it offline. We will get our last question in, so folks can go home and have dinner, <laughs> including me. Uh, to what extent do you think that the um, increase in carbon dioxide and hence the increase in temperature could be negated by uh, all the roofs on the planet Earth being painted white, there, perhaps highways and... Actually, there's the Department of, Department of Energy has looked into this, and it's surprising how much can be done. If, if people could come up with paint um, that would make all, sun, all highways highly reflective and all roofs highly reflective, it may actually offset a decade of carbon dioxide increase. Um, so it's, it's not as crazy as it might sound. Yeah. Well, it seems like it would be easier to paint the roofs than reduce the uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah, it would. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, it's going to be very costly to reduce carbon dioxide, and it's going to take a long time. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs>